Hello, everybody. My name is Joshua Vonderheide, and I am the founder of the Percussion Conservatory, where I am very excited to be welcoming our next guest here on A Percussion Story. Joining us today is Mr. Aaron Dowry, who's the assistant principal percussionist of the National Symphony Orchestra. Aaron, we are very excited to have you here today. Thank you so much for being with us. And I'm just going to jump right in with our first question. And I'd like to ask you if you could share a little bit about your musical journey and just how you first got started as a percussionist. Well, that's, that's, it's a long story. I, um, I actually started playing percussion when I was about uh, four years old. I actually was always kind of drawn to, you know, I was banging on pots and pans and things as a kid, like a really little kid sitting on the floor. And believe it or not, I grew up down the street from John Bassesi, who I saw recently did some master classes with you guys. And he was my first like percussion teacher. Um, I'll be honest, I don't actually remember a whole lot of my <laughs> instruction with him. I think I was like six years old, seven years old. But, you know, ever, ever from that point, I just felt like it was something that I loved doing. It was something that I felt really comfortable doing. You know, it, it, it's always been a really engaging thing for me to do, you know, and, and, and I think the, like, from a, being a kid, like the physical aspect of playing percussion was something that I was really drawn to, you know, not just drum set, but like I, you know, playing the snare drum, you know, once I started learning mallet instruments in middle school, it was just kind of, it, to me, it seemed like a very logical flow towards, um, you know, going to college for music. I had the fortune of being able to study with um, the principal percussionist in Buffalo, uh, Mark Hodges, for I think it was about eight years. It was a really long time. Well, I was, and that it really gave me the the standing I needed to to kind of to get ready to go to college and and kind of you know certainly when I got there I, I felt like I felt prepared for that environment. I felt you know ready for the challenges of being thrown into you know what is like an undergrad degree in in percussion and you know learning from your colleagues and it was really great to be to be at um carnegie mellon where i went to undergrad i studied with uh tim adams for one year and then uh jeremy branson for three and and paul evans also while i was there and that was really kind of the spot where i developed a love for classical music um because it, it took me some time to to really, really feel like I connected with classical music and, and you know, got interested in it in a way that was like, oh, oh, this, like, I could do this for a living. I, you know, I, this is something I'd want to do. And I remember kind of around my, my junior year, just kind of deciding like, okay, you know, if I'm going to do this, like, I, I'm going to put everything that I have into it. And that was the point where, you know, I, I, you know, I started trying to go to music festivals and things like that things like that, really kind of making the effort to, to completely throw myself into the classical percussion world. Maybe you so, could... you know, on, on a side note for students listening that, that maybe didn't go to summer festivals, you know, freshman year, sophomore year, I didn't go to fresh, I didn't go to festivals freshman or sophomore year. Um, so everybody can kind of take those at their own pace. Yeah, I was I was going to ask you, maybe you could talk a little bit about your festival experience, because this is something I had actually heard. I don't know if it was mentioned from me from Stephen Keener or if I had heard you say it on a, a different show at some point. But I remember you had talked about this, about, you know, the, the festivals and, and sort of competitions and your or your background. And you're talking about, you know, you started very young. I'd be curious to kind of hear just that process of maybe when you started taking auditions in general, mm. uh, the, fest the festivals that you did go to and kind of when you went to them and just maybe uh, some, some early audition experiences. Yeah. Um, probably, you know, would be my junior year. Um, I, I auditioned for Tanglewood, I think that year I did, I auditioned for a bunch of festivals that year. Um, I also took, that was the first year that I did the Atlanta standard competition, which I think at the time was still very early on, you know, it's when Tom was still in Atlanta and running it. Um, 
And which you, which you really, did pretty well at, right? You did, uh, fair, you did fairly well yeah. at this. Maybe you could tell yeah. everyone how you did at this. Thank you. Yes, I, uh, I came in second place the first year I did it, and I came in third place the next year that I did it. Um, but I did get a really, really awesome uh, Cooper Mid Rope Drum that I still have and I still use the, during one of those auditions or one of those competitions. I forget the, what the award was, but... Um, I was, I was very pleased to have that because, you know, I, I still use it, uh, on the job and I use it in San Diego. I used it in San Diego. I use it with the NSO here and there. Very cool. So I'd be mm -hmm. curious as we're talking about some of these early influences, I had no idea, but since age six, I mean, that's a pretty yeah. strong foundation. That's pretty dang good. But how about, uh, some of these other musical influences, growing up, maybe they're percussionists, maybe they're non-percussionists and how they shaped your approach to percussion. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, like I said, uh, Bissessi was one of my first teachers. I think he really just kind of got me some building blocks at that point. Um, you know, like I said, I was six or seven. I don't actually remember what I was learning with him at that time. Uh, maybe he remembers more than I do, but I, I know with, uh, with Mark Hodges, when I was in middle school and high school, it just kind of started learning, you know, Peter's etudes and a little bit of, um, that's when I started learning mallet instruments was, you know, when I was in late in middle school. But I, I would say my, my teachers in college were kind of my, my biggest influences. I mean, as I think most, most people's are, I learned how to work hard from Tim Adams. And I think that was, to this day, one of the most important things I learned in school was was work ethic. I mean, I learned and, and saw, you know, in my undergrad years that, you know, the people that worked hard really saw the most progress and really had the most success. And, um, you know, even just for my, my first year, putting the time in to, to work was, I, I saw the, the growth in my own playing, um, even beyond what I was doing in my lessons, just, you know, practicing and working hard. And then I think from, from there, you know, learning with, um, with Jeremy Branson, I, he kind of steered me towards where I eventually went for grad school, which is Temple, um, and really kind of learning more about Alan Abel and, you know, eventually getting to study with Alan Abel was, it felt like a, a culmination of like those three years that I, you know, spent with Mr. Branson, like thinking of all the things that he taught me, you know, was, was a lot of things that he learned from Abel and, and getting to study with him. I don't know. In my head, I always kind of felt like Yoda, uh, you know, <laughs> like he, he taught so many, so many people out there with jobs at this point. And he just like the stories he had and, and the, the wealth of knowledge that he had in like how to play things and, and how he did things and how, how he kind of thought about music was, was really special. That's really cool. And, you know, as you're gaining these skills and you're getting information from these master pedagogues, the, the conversation kind of switches a little bit because you're starting to play more and more meaningful performances. And I know mm -hmm. for me, when I was 14, I, I tell this story frequently, there was the TMEA all state Texas <laughs> experience, you know, and I was playing principal timpani, whatever that yeah. means when you're, whenever, when you're 14, but I was playing principal timpani on Medea meditation, uh, and dance of vengeance and also on symphonic metamorphosis with really, really high level high school kids. And so yeah, yeah. I had no, that was my first time ever playing with an orchestra ever of any kind. And then you're playing those pieces on timpani that cemented, I was, for sure, I'm going to be a percussionist. That's the coolest thing you could ever possibly hope to do as a young 14 year old. So that was for me like this very transformative experience. I'm curious if you have a moment like that in your career where you could really recall a specific performance or some sort of moment that had that really significant impact on you and what made that memorable for you? Yeah, I have certainly a number of performances that i can remember through like throughout my career both when i was a kid and and, and much more recently also you know I, I was a member of all the kind of all county ensembles and things like that but i the thing that i remember the most was we were playing um russian easter overture with the greater buffalo youth orchestra 
and um just kind of having this moment of like oh this is a really cool piece like this is this is actually kind of fun like classical music isn't boring i mean maybe i was i was like 13 or 14 so at that point like uh, if you're not already like in the classical music it takes a little bit of time to kind of get you into it um and along those same lines uh the year before i went to college i remember seeing uh Buffalo play Shostakovich's 11th symphony. And I, you know, I wasn't a member of that performance. I was in the audience, but I just remember being so blown away by like the power of that music. And that kind of started my uh, interest in, well, Shostakovich for one, uh, being one of my favorite composers. And also just like, kind of the the power that an orchestra can have and like it like that was the first concert that i saw that i was like truly moved Mm -hmm. um and a number of years later i was actually able to play that piece with with san diego and that was kind of one of the next big moments of like oh this is you know kind of your bucket list pieces right and i just remember that whole week i was just it just felt so cool to play this piece that I had heard when I was a senior in high school that kind of kicked off this idea that like, Oh, I, I really could be a classical musician. And and like, there's a lot of really cool classical music out there. Yeah, absolutely. And while quickly, while we're on this topic of making things memorable, I'd like to Mm -hmm. thank majestic percussion who I've just become a distributor with, if you can believe that. So if you guys ever need Majestic gear, our (laughs) Percussion Conservatory members get discounts on all Majestic gear. So just be in touch with me if you need anything. But the reason I'm shouting them out, uh, besides being our principal sponsor, is that Majestic, every year, we're trying to make our scholarship bigger and bigger. And I reached out and I said, guys, what can we do this year to make the scholarship bigger? And they gave us three drums this year instead of one last year. And one of the things we talked about was to do this, to to do more stuff online, on YouTube, in public, because Majestic has committed for the Percussion Conservatory to help us make more memorable performances, to make more opportunities for percussionists to connect. Clearly, I play on their instruments at home. I love them. And I was just at PASIC, got to meet up with Nick Milliner and the Jerry's. If you guys ever go to PASIC or TMEA or something and you meet them, you'll know who I'm talking about. And they had Chris Lamb there, Shi Wu there, had all the the new Opus One drums all lined up in like a giant circle, and we were playing on them. And it's really, really good stuff. So if you guys have a chance to hear those drums or you want to learn more about that, please do so. And the best thing that you could do to help us grow this channel is to subscribe. So if you hit the like button or comment or subscribe, or please do all three, ding the bell and turn on your notifications, then more and more good stuff will come all of the proceeds of this channel go to our scholarship fund. Anything that's majestic that I sell, 100% of the profits go to our scholarship fund. So everything that we're doing is to raise money for our scholarship, which is about to end. If you're watching this, it's too late. You missed the application for this year, but next year we'll be having another scholarship. We do it every single year and the prizes are gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. So big thanks to Majestic for helping us do that. All right, Majestic plug over. And now we need to talk about how your musical style has evolved. So I like this question because I feel like percussion takes so long because of so many instruments. You're talking about, you didn't even start playing mallet instruments until you're already like significantly into middle school. You started snare drum much earlier. You're you know, six years old, you're five years old. And then you get into college and you have these major performances that you see and they impact you and these teachers impact you in a certain way. And by that time, like, you might have gone through three or four philosophies of life in that amount of time, right? So I'm curious, like how your style and your approach to percussion has evolved over time. Yeah, it certainly evolved a lot early on when, uh, as I, I guess, as I was getting more serious about doing doing this for a living um, and kind of really once i decided that okay i'm going to go to college for music i knew that i i needed to kind of buckle down and and learn more instrument like learn how to play timpani for one and kind of get better at these mallet instruments that i wasn't always so keen on i think when you're 
younger, it's difficult to all the, I guess all these different techniques, like formal techniques and like also reading, you know, music and notes. If, you know, for me, I didn't start out playing piano. I started out um, playing, you know, snare drum and drum set and things like that. So I, I came to reading, act, like actually reading, you know, music a little bit later. So that was something that was, was difficult for me, but I, I, you know, I really had to work at it. So I'd say like early on, a lot of my, my work and my philosophy was just kind of technique based, like learn how to play the instruments, learn how to be very pro proficient at all of these instruments, learn how to move my hands in a way that felt intuitive and basically kind of gave me the ability to produce what I was seeing on the page and make those sounds on a very basic level at this point, you know, when I was in college, you know, I, I really started working at, you know, hand speed, you know, being able to read sight, read music, being able to, you know, form out a technique, things like that. Just, you know, a lot of, a lot, a lot of technique work because then when it comes time to kind of add musicality or add, you know, phrasing or touch or things like that, if you have this level of, you know, for lack of a better word, mastery over these instruments and, and over, you know, the sticks that you're holding in your hands, any feedback you get from a teacher, any changes that you want to make while you're playing become really doable because you have that fine control over the instruments. So then, you know, as I started going to grad school and, and working towards that, um, I, I kind of took a step towards growing musically and, and really kind of expanding my like musical language in terms of like how I phrase things. And that was kind of the same time that I started getting serious about taking auditions. I, I, I decided that I wanted everything that I played to sound musical and to sound intentional. Like I wanted, all of these instruments to sound like, I guess I had an idea in my head of like this sound that I wanted to get from the instruments um, beyond just the phrasing of something, you know, like when you hit a marimba, you know, you can, you can just kind of hit it and it's not necessarily a pretty sound, but you know, if you really think about how you're going to hit it or, and how you can use that to phrase music, that adds a whole level of depth. So I, I went through a big period of time during grad school where I kind of like reverse engineered a lot of technique actually to be able to make different sounds on the instruments. I, some of it worked, some of it didn't. I mean, I was doing a lot of this kind of just on my own. It wasn't necessarily work I was doing with uh, Chris Vinny or Alan Abel. I would kind of just, you know, bring in whatever was preparing to them. And, and sometimes things would work, sometimes they didn't. It was a challenge because it, it really, I mean, it just meant a lot of time in the practice room, kind of like thinking about how am I holding the sticks? Like, where am I holding the sticks? You know, if I choke up on the stick, does it make a different sound? If I choke back, does, you know, like all these little kind of almost micromanaging things that I may or may not have needed to do all of when I was going through it. But I mean, that, that put me in good stead. I mean, I, I won the audition in San Diego during my second year of grad school. So, I mean, in that respect, it really worked out. And then I'd say that the last real transition in my, you know, style and approach to these instruments came during the pandemic. I had been back on the audition circuit for some time and to be honest, had some really poor results in Philly and Kansas City right before everything shut down. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so that leads us ah, into- Yes, our next here question. we go. Maybe you could talk to us about this challenge. That was gonna be the next question. How did you overcome this challenge? Yeah. We're in this dip, it's COVID, things like, you know, haven't been working out the way you maybe had hoped or maybe, you know, the, the first job maybe isn't exactly what you thought, I have no idea. Share with us what's going on with these challenges. Oh man. So this, I definitely have a lot to say about these questions. I think this is something that everybody is going to experience. I recognize that I had a lot of success early on in my career, you know, with the snare drum competitions and getting into music festivals and 
you know, winning a job when I was in grad school, it wasn't until I got back on the audition circuit a few years after I had started in San Diego that I really kind of experienced that struggle of like, I'm not, I'm not playing the way I want to play in these auditions. I'm like, I have this idea of, you know, the way I want to sound and the way I want to play and, you know, it's varying degrees of success along the way. Um, but certainly right before the, I was, I was, I was at a low point. I really did not play well in either one of those auditions. And, and in some respects, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that I was, you know, I had a job and, and I had a very secure place to experience that pandemic from. I mean, it was, it was, it's not to say it wasn't scary, but I had, a position where I was able to create a lot of space to kind of rediscover, you know, why, why I was doing this, why was I taking auditions? Why was I, you know, playing percussion? And, and I think a lot of us had had similar experiences, but what really helped me was I, I started taking lessons with Theo Milkoff, who is, for those of you that haven't seen his videos on YouTube, um, he is an unbelievable marimba player. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I could never hope to play that. You know, it's just, <laughs> yeah. You know, I was learning like the basics of his technique, and you know, I think his technique is fascinating and mm. really interesting. And I, you know, started to to dig into it, but at a certain point, I was like, okay, I don't know if like this is what I want to do. I I really want to take you know what I was learning in those lessons which wasn't just the technique. It was like, how do you think about music? Like, it's not just, you know, I'm playing the xylophone. It's not just, I'm playing the snare drum, you know, just this idea of like, okay, I guess what the way he likes to put it is that you're playing the marimba like pianistically as if you're a piano player and you think about the phrases that you're creating and you think about the music you're making as if you're a piano player, like they, you know, it's not just like strict rhythms. It's not just, you know, play the page, add dynamics and rubato for the sake of adding rubato. It's really kind of digging into the chordal structure of the music and, and you know, adding some theory. And I mean, I could go on and on about what I learned from him, but the the thing that really helped me, you know, in terms of my actual playing was just, I kind of applied those concepts to every instrument. Like you, you know, you play the snare drum and you're like, okay, let's, let's pretend it's not a snare drum. Let's just pretend that these are, you know, what I'm looking at on the page, you know, it's a delicate etude. It's just, it's music. You're trying to like sing it to someone, you know, how would you sing it so that it made sense and then play it like that? You know, and obviously there's steps, you know, in the practicing is like, okay, how do I get it to sound like that? How do I, you know, play the notes to make it sound like that? And and, and that really added this level of, I think, intensity and um, musicality to my playing. I think I was, I was, I got to a point where I was like forcing it. I was trying really hard to be musical instead of just thinking about, okay, what's the music to be made here? You know, what is the music that I want to make here? It's not It's not necessarily what's written on the page. It's not how somebody else plays. It's like, you know, how, how do I want this to sound? And if somebody doesn't like it, they don't like it. But if I'm confident in the way I want something to sound, then that comes across. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I think I'm going to get this quote right, I really hope I get it right from him, but maybe you'll know better. He He had mentioned on a YouTube video that I saw once that, you can always keep practicing and it can always get better. So you could have eight missed notes and then you practice and then you have six and then you, and it got better. And then you practice f f again for 20 more hours and then you have four wrong notes and it's better than it was. And you can just keep practicing with this law of diminishing returns it, and it's mm -hmm. just getting better. And his mindset is that that's the wrong way to practice that you have to first imagine exactly how you want it to be 
down to every sound, every movement, every color, you have to have mm -hmm. in your mind exactly what it should sound like. And then you start practicing and, and you're always yes. aiming for it's You're always aiming for that to come out. And if it's not coming out, then you critically problem solve until that comes out, but you never just practice to get better. You only practice to have those ideas emerge out of your sound. And that I think is a very powerful way to think about music. I was very impressed yeah. with that video and it did, it impacted me. I still remember it. I mean, this was just, a, this was just a YouTube video in passing. And I, yeah. I like sat back in my chair. I was like, whoa, like this, this is someone who's really figured some stuff out here with music making. Maybe you can talk, I mean, you took lessons with, maybe you could speak to this a bit. Yeah. I mean, that, that concept is is one of the first things once we actually started working on pieces um i mean the first couple lessons were all just exercises and trying to kind of learn the technique but once we started playing these pieces like i would you know i would play it and and one of the first questions he would always ask me was is that how you wanted it to sound or like like what are you thinking like what how do you want this to sound and trying to get me to like explain in words what I was going for and like, am I going for a light touch here? Where is the weight? And like all these little tiny thoughts about, you know, eight bars of music that, you know, at the time, you know, when you first start doing it feels overwhelming. Like it's, it's a lot to think about, but I think a lot of that just uh, becomes second nature, the more you do it. And then you just kind of like, you, you look at a piece of music and you can kind of visualize it in your head. And like, and that just kind of comes out then in, in your playing once you've kind of done the work to say, okay, I have this idea in my head of what I want this to sound like, you know, beyond more than just dynamics and rubato. It, it's about the touch on the instrument. It's about all these little things. And, and the more detailed an idea you can have in your head, the better the chance of you being able to recreate that on the instrument. Because if, you know, if you kind of zoom out and just have this, you know, wide angle lens on, on a piece that you want to play, it's not going to have a lot of depth and it's not going to have a lot of subtlety and, and it may sound very good. It may be note accurate and they have dynamics, but there's this emotional element in music and like, you know, I hesitate to say like passion, <laughs> but you know, there's an element of that energy that you give into the music when you're performing that you can't really explain what it is or how to do it it's but when when it happens and when you hear it and when you do it you can feel it and the audience can feel it and you know or the audition panel can feel it and it, it's it's one of those things where it's just like you know when you hear somebody play something and it's just like heart-wrenching or you know you you want to like get up and run through a wall because you like you're so fired up you know, it's that extra, le that's the extra level. And that's, that's kind of what he's trying to get. And all of these little tiny pieces, those, those are really what he's trying to get you to think about. And once you apply that to, you know, every instrument you play, it opens up this whole new kind of world of sounds and this world of like characters and just, you know, it, it gets you to a point in your percussion playing that, you know, you kind of stop seeing all of these instruments as percussion instruments. You, you know, it's just like, okay, I am connected to these instruments this like as much as, you know, uh, somebody that has a wind instrument up to their lips or somebody, you know, a, a violin player who is, you know, actually touching the strings. You develop that level of connection with these instruments and that, you know, it, it kind of is a big part of that, that next level of like just a musician, I think, you know. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's a way that we overcome a lot of challenges is to stop necessarily thinking of them as just challenges, even though we know they are, and to start thinking of them as opportunities, these opportunities to connect further, these opportunities to move an audience, these opportunities to collaborate with other people and the way that you want to express your intention with your passion. Yeah. And so I, I do think when you're talking about that, like this passion that's moving through you, I think mm -hmm. that happens when, when people are really able to move another person with their music making is when that passion is 
with the combination of great technique is serving their intention. They had this initial concept and the passion flows through them and the technique helps them bring out the intention. And it just becomes yeah. this synergistic, incredible force of, you know, the dedication. One of the very first things you said today was, I have noticed that working really, really hard leads to, you know, good things, right? So it's when, when you've yeah. been working so hard and diligently, as you're saying, reverse engineering technique and, and things not working and failing and trying again and going through low points and really putting in the time and effort when that gets combined with passion and the humility to continue as you're, I mean, you and I are, I'm sure a similar age here. I don't know exactly how yeah. old you are, but we're of, of a similar age and we've been doing this for a little while. And you start to think like, okay, what, what's next for me? It's like, well, I might just need more lessons like <laughs> from the right type of person. And some people are unwilling, unwilling to take lessons. I've arrived, I've mastered yeah. things. And, and I'm really against that. I mean, I think lifelong learning is the only way to make sure you just don't lose your mind. I mean, if I'm not still learning, I'm just so bored. I, like it doesn't feel good to be at the top of Everest all by yourself. You know, it's just, it's a terrible feeling. Right. And so you want to have some amount of climb always in front of you just to, to keep moving forward. And so anyways, yeah. that's what, that's what I'm mean, gleaning from our talk so far. It's inspiring. I love yeah, it. Ex exactly. And I think like along those lines, at, at the end of the day, you really have to, you have to love doing this. And I think that that's the other thing I've noticed about the people that have success in this is that they, they really love playing percussion and playing these instruments and playing classical music. Like, and that was kind of another, another piece of, I guess, going, going back to this, this question, like the other thing that I really worked on during the pandemic and kind of coming out of the pandemic was to be honest, my own mental health and trying to kind of, incorporate i mean something that i that i think is is really important is is cultivating um good mental health like within your career and you know within your home life and just like looking at it as as a whole and i had a lot of help and support during that time um you know from my wife from my family and you know from a therapist that i was seeing and i and i think i want to take a minute to to say that 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 work on myself really helped me get to a point where you know i kind of remembered and and really tapped into that love for what i do and honestly just like uh i guess kind of figuring out what you know what i wanted in life and what i wanted from music and what i wanted from you know my my home life and what i you know and all these things and being able to put that together as a whole and not just saying, okay, like my career is one thing and, you know, the work that I do for there is totally different than, you know, maybe work I do at home or, you know, my relationship or, or, you know, all of those things. I think being able to have a kind of secure grounded place to work from, be it you know, whatever, you know, a roommate or your friend group or, you know, your marriage, like that did so much more for me than, you know, just practicing on its own, um, you know, kind of like burying all the, I guess, burying all the feelings and, and the struggle. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll illustrate that for those people that, you know, are not familiar with, with, kind of what was happening around the time where I won the job here with the NSO. Um, I was in contention for the, the principal job in Baltimore and I had done my trial weeks and about a week before the audition for the NSO, I found out that I didn't get the job in Baltimore. And, you know, that was really crushing. Like that was at the time also a job that I, that I really wanted. And, you know, I knew I couldn't really bank on any of, you know, obviously when you take auditions like that, but at that point it's down to two people. So you feel a lot closer there. Sure. Um, of course. Yeah. So that, that moment of just extreme disappointment, I kind of, in, instead of just kind of like burying those, those feelings and, and just like, you know, not dealing with it, 
I had a really crappy two days and, you know, really leaned on my family and my wife. And by actually kind of, you know, facing the fact that I was just, I was crushed that I didn't get that job. I was so disappointed and I was sad. And like all of those things that I was feeling, I just kind of like, I, I was, I looked at that and, and thought, okay, you know, I'm going to feel these things at some point anyway. So I'm going to feel them now so that I can just go kind of clean slate into the next thing. And, you know, it wasn't so much that I used that as, you know, I guess like revenge energy to win the next audition. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, right, right. it was just, it was more that like I felt settled and, and I felt like, okay, you know, I'm sad about that. I, I acknowledge all these feelings. And let's go move on to the next thing. And, and you know, what was that, the the next thing, you know, like all of a sudden you have to audition for NSO. And by the way, I had no idea about that story. I mean, this is, this is fascinating, oh, yeah. very interesting to me. Um, I was, you know, just, oh my gosh, so many things going on in my personal life. Yeah. I can, we'll have to catch up another time. I got yeah, a whole yeah. story Definitely. for you about moving from Malaysia to the United States, which was what I was going through at that time that you're talking about. But what about that? NSO audition. So like you, you've just now had this news, you've, you've allowed yourself the time to settle, you've allowed yourself the time to process as best you can in such a short mm -hmm. amount of time, those feelings, you walk into the NSO audition and, and what happens? You have to play three rounds. So like you have, I mean, what was that, that experience of like such an emotional time? And maybe you could detail what the audition process was like for you. Yeah. So fortunately, I had I had been able to sub there a couple times before this audition. So, you know, I think just the idea of, of walking into a building that you've been to before, you know, there's I think there's an element of, of some auditions you take where you're like, you know, I remember when I took the Philly audition, I I, well, I performed there with the Temple Orchestra once, but like I'd never really been on stage at the at the Kimmel Center. And there's always that moment of just like, oh, my God, like you look at this building and with this one, there was a comfort of you know, the backstage areas, like I, I knew, felt like a space that like I knew where to go. So there wasn't that kind of confusion. But beyond that, I think I just looked at, I looked at each round as, you know, this is the music that I need to play. This is, you know, this is the place I'm going to do it in. And I think the other thing that I, I had kind of done, and I had taken this approach going into the Baltimore edition also was, I realized that once I got you know, these excerpts or these solos to a point, you know, where I was producing them at a level that I was happy with, or that I was like, okay, yeah, this sounds good. This is, I, you know, this is the way I want this to sound. I think at that point, I was like, okay, I don't need to try to make this sound better. So the, the practicing at that point became more about executing something the same way every time and you know maybe that was like okay where am i standing in front of the instrument how am i holding the sticks like little things little things that you can control day in day out and you can control them on the day of the audition so having practiced all these excerpts and all these solos in a way that i was like okay i don't need to try super hard i had everything prepared to a point where i was like this i know this sounds the way i want it to sound so i just need to play it the way i've played it every day like i don't I don't need this audition to be like the most musical thing I've ever played or the most beautiful thing that I've ever done. It just needs to be me and what I've been doing every day. And I played, you know, fortunately I was pre-advanced to the, to the semifinal round uh, coming from another position. So, you know, my, my semifinal round was pretty good and, and, um, you know, obviously I made it, made it through to the final <laughs> round. And it, no, it was terrible. And it, and it, the worst it, round you yeah. ever played. And they just, you they know, just was, felt like, yeah, we'll pass this guy. No, of course you played well. Was, yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it was one of those things where like I played everything and, and, and everything was good. Everything was, you know, like, okay, that's, that's more or less how I'd like to play it. And having the validation of them, like, okay, I made the finals on just, you know, this is good. You know, right. this is the way I play. Then, and then that's kind of a validation to me of, oh, they like the way I play. Like, I just, I don't need to try extra hard to sound different. I just need to, to be me. Uh, this is awesome stuff. I want to take a really brief aside and then let you continue. But, but yeah. I want to answer this next question ah, first. Yeah. 
about aspiring percussionists looking to make a mark, what would you, what advice would you give them based on your own experiences? And I would just say, based on what you just said, there's a yeah. certain aspect of this that's just a numbers game. You get to a certain place with your playing. I mean, if you're never advancing at any auditions, keep mm -hmm. working, right? Keep working. Yeah. It's just not, it's not quite happening yet. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It just means at this exact moment, you're not advancing yet. So keep working. Yeah. But once you start advancing and maybe with some amount of regularity, one out of two, one out of three auditions, you're advancing mm -hmm. some, some amount of regularity, it a little bit, a little bit becomes a numbers game where you yes. just need to take, you just need to take a lot of auditions guys, because someone like Aaron just said, is going to like you that they're going to like the way you just, this is yes. how I see the music and they're going to agree. They're going to say, I also like to see the music that way. And then what happens is that you play with people that actually you're going to want to work with instead of trying to be, you know, trying to please some panel in some certain way. I think, it, I think it is important a little bit to respect if you know there's a history or a style within that orchestra, mm -hmm. you might want to bring that to the table and show them that you can do that. But for the majority of what you play, my advice to this question would just be, it's a little bit of a numbers game. If you develop your raw talent and, and you've been playing for a lot of people and they're saying, you sound great, but you're just making semis or, you know, you make a final and you get cut, just keep going, just do more of them. Right. But maybe you can continue on with your story now and answer this question. So I'm sure there's an answer to this question in this story is what I feel like. Yeah, there definitely. I think kind of the, so the, like the culmination of all of this is, you know, by the time I got to the final round, I wasn't trying to do anything extra. I guess like that's kind of the key word is I wasn't trying. It was just doing, which, you know, sounds kind of maybe cliche and maybe a little too philosoph philosophical. But I think once you once you reach a point and 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 just kind of develop the way that you want to play, and maybe there's you know certain little things that you like to do, or maybe there are you know a, a tempo you like to take this excerpt at, or you know just having the conviction to develop your sound and and i you know i use a lot of feedback on the way like i'll you know i play for people i i use the fact that okay like when i played you know here i advanced when i played here i didn't and like i was always very cognizant of the things that i you know that worked better for me or the things that i had success with you know be it playing something slower or you know playing something faster or playing something cleaner, but maybe a little bit louder, you know, once you start having that success and like, say you're making semis and making finals, you don't really have to do anything more at that point. It's like you said, it's a numbers game. And it's also just, you know, sometimes you have a really good day and sometimes you have a really bad day and that doesn't make you a bad musician or a good musician. It just means maybe it was raining and you got a little wet on the way to the <laughs> hall and that made you upset. And, you know, literally things, things like this to kind of go back to the story by the time I, I got and like stepped out on stage for the final round, I, I was like, okay, I don't need to play any of these things any differently than the way I've been playing them in the practice room or, you know, at home, I don't need to, make something more musical than I've been practicing. And I just need to go out and, and do it. And, and there's almost a level of like, kind of stepping back from your boundaries and everything just kind of feels easier. For me, the thing that felt easy was like, oh, I don't need to try extra hard for any of this. I just need to do it. You know, I don't need to play this softer than I've been playing it. I don't need to play this louder than I've been playing it. Right. Um, and obviously you, you know, I had put the time in at that, you know, to get to that point where I was like, oh, you know, everything's where I'd like it to be now, on top of that. I, I had a really, really good day, but you can kind of, by finding out the things that you can control and kind of tapping into that, you know, at least for me, tapping into that level of like, okay, I don't need to try so hard. My ratio of good days to bad days just kind of like skyrocketed um, and also just to remember that i mean you're saying 
you start a percussion when you're five to six, you win this job yeah. when, when you're in your thirties. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. that's yeah. 25 years. Right. So I think, I think a lot of times, a long time. kids start when they're 11, 12, 13, and you might want one of these destination jobs. Okay. That's great. Mm -hmm. 20 years, <laughs> you know, like you, it might be yeah. 20 years. It might be 25 years. It might be 30 years, but if you don't give up, and you're relentless. Uh, the word I like to use a lot is you, humility. If you're kind of relentless with your humility, yeah. to just say, mm -hmm. that's okay. I didn't get this one. That's okay. I might need to take a lesson. Sure. Yes. I can forgive myself for yeah, exactly. being, exactly. being grumpy about the rain or anything. Yeah. Or I used to, like in my case, like I used to have a full-time job. Currently, I don't. Like if you're going to take auditions again, how is that going to affect your mentality? Like if there's so mm -hmm. many, there's so many different pathways. And I think sometimes we get caught up in this idea that you need to have gone to undergrad and then, you know, and you're, unfortunately you're like perpetuating this stereotype. Like you need to do your undergrad yeah. and then get your job during your master's. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah. And you did that. And it does happen to people. And that's mm -hmm. great to show too, that it is possible to win a job while you're in school. People do it regularly, but it's also yeah. it's also just fine to win a job when you're 35 or 55. Like th that's fine yeah. too. Like the, exactly. people do, that, people do exactly. that all the time too. So I, I one of the reasons we're doing this show is just to show people that there's so many different types of people who have different mental attitudes, different emotional states, different economic backgrounds or ethnic backgrounds mm -hmm. that we all come from and we can all arrive at this same place and there are common threads that help people get there and so i i have enjoyed learning a lot today about these common threads from you yeah. Aaron. It's been it's been really great and mm -hmm. i'd like to ask you one final question if you haven't finished that yeah. previous one please please finish your answer but the next question will also be if you have any upcoming projects or any other ambitions. I mean, not to say that you've arrived and you're now done, yeah. but I, I would assume that this is again, like we're saying, this is a step in your journey, right? And so yeah. I would love to know about what else is keeping you inspired and things that are coming up. This being my first year with the NSO, I mean, there's a lot of concerts that we're doing that are, you know, already have been exciting and, and, and will be exciting. Um, personally, um, I, you know, I'm very excited for the, you know, we're going, the orchestra is going on tour in Europe in February. And as someone that's, that's never had a chance to go on a tour with an orchestra before, that's, that's really exciting for me. And, you know, beyond that, we have a couple concerts that I'm, I'm, you know, personally excited about. We have uh, uh, a Duke Ellington show coming up in uh march and and something that i've gotten to do you know in, in my time in san diego and, and a little bit here so far is get to play some drum set with the orchestra which really kind of taps into a, another level of of excitement for me as you know there's like that that inner kid that just loves playing drum set and and obviously there's there's so much more to playing drum set with the orchestra but every time i get to do that it just feels satisfying on a different level where it's it's not just about the notes on the page and it, it's a little bit about kind of the excitement of you know the improvisatory aspect of jazz or um feeling a groove really well with you know the rhythm section that's around you or things like that so i'm i'm really excited about that um i'm also doing some chamber music with some of the musicians of the nso which is something that i have not had a a big chance to do uh, mm -hmm. in my career. So that's something that's really exciting to get to get to play in the small ensemble. It just kind of taps into this level of of listening and feeling the music with a small group. And I think honestly, we, we always try to recreate in the orchestra, but it's the more people you have, the harder it gets. So it's nice to, to bring it down to a smaller scale. So those are probably the things I'm, I'm most excited about coming up. And I'm really hopeful that I can do more chamber music here and just kind of branch out into the kind of musical community that's here in DC. Like it's a huge, 
huge community of, of percussionists and musicians. I'm excited to be a, a part of that. I think it's really gratifying. It's really humbling also to constantly be around so many professional musicians and, and so many other percussionists uh, that it, it's inspiring. That's awesome. And we were, we're just uh, having on recently, well, actually, we're in the middle of a residency with Wesley Sumter. I know he oh, yeah. was, out, was out there recently. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's it's very cool that NSO is a, is a group that, you know, plays these pieces that are, you guys are constantly bringing in percussionists. There's a lot of work to do. You guys do major, major works. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a that's a very dynamic way to get to know the community is to just play next to them, right? To stand side by stand side by side with these other just top level musicians around the country. So that's yeah. definitely a very cool experience that you get through your full time position. So Aaron, yeah, truly. thank you. Thank you so, so much for yeah, taking the time to do, to do this, for sharing your journey with us, for sharing insights with us. Uh, and for being very open and vulnerable with yeah, us. We really appreciate everything that you've shared with us today. Would you like to leave us with any closing thoughts, words of advice, words of wisdom, a funny anecdote, anything you like? Well, I think just for everybody that's out there listening, kind of going through either the same journey that I was on or a different journey, find a way to kind of bring all the aspects of your life together. And that does more than than any amount of time in the practice room will do because if you're if you're approaching music if you're approaching your life from you know a more grounded well-rounded place it just makes everything a little bit easier so awesome well we really appreciate having you on that's all for yeah. today and aaron we look very right. much forward to yeah. hearing you play more often and we look forward to hopefully getting some some more content from you in the future here at the percussion conservatory yeah. so feel yeah. free to you know design a course whatever you want to do with us guys it's a all right you know, it'd be it'd be great to have to see you play as yeah. well well thank you so much for having me on josh i appreciate it awesome it guys until the next one on that yeah. outro hit that subscribe button all right we love you guys see ya